Welcome to Faith and Science. I'm Dr. John Ashton. And today we'll be looking again at some of the issues that are confronting uh, particularly young folk with regard to belief in the Bible. These issues largely uh, focus around the teaching of the theory of evolution, which seems to point to long ages for life on earth and that life slowly evolved over long periods of time. And of course, this is very different to the creation's account in the Bible, which clearly teaches that God created the heavens and the earth in six literal days and then rested on the seventh day. And hence we have the weekly cycle. And when we think about it, there's no other cultural explanation for the seven-day week other than this was put in place by God to remind us that he is the creator. When the uh, books of the uh, Old Testament of the Bible were written, most people on earth believed in other sorts of gods. And when we look at the accounts of these other types of gods in Egypt and Greece and Rome, China and in Central America, these gods were very different to the God of love that we find exemplified by the life of Jesus who was God himself coming down in the form of man to show us what he was really like. And we, when we read the teachings of Jesus and, and the love that he showed to people and the care that he showed to people, the forgiveness and grace he showed to people, this contrasts very much so with the uh, pagan gods that demanded different types of sacrifices. And, and certainly you earned the blessing of these supposed gods by doing things whereas the Christian God is very much a God of grace. He gives us the gift of eternal life when we recognise him and uh, accept the values of his kingdom. And when we look at what the, uh, the message of the creationist week and the seven-day week is to remind us of this all the time. So it's really a, a very important cycle. Now, on the other hand, there, within our science education system today, there's a very, very strong push to say that everything came into existence by itself, that there are somehow processes in the universe, in the uh, structure of matter itself, in the structure of energy that can somehow bring about all the amazing complex uh, species and plants and animals and, and even the structure of the stars that we observe, that somehow these can form by itself. So this is essentially the, the teaching of naturalism, that, that there is no God, um, or if there is a God, that he's simply just a part of the creation and not the uh, creator. So this is a very, very different account to what the Bible is uh, clearly saying. So what we need to look at now is the, is the evidence. What is the evidence? What is the evidence that we can go out and measure here and now? And essentially that's what science is all about. And in the previous sessions we've looked at leading scientists who have said, well, hang on, when we look at the evidence... The evidence points clearly to the fact that evolutionary theory is impossible. It, it can't work. Now, in particular, we've been looking at uh, the accounts of scientists who are creationists that have been uh, compiled in the book in six days. And I know there's been some question: where can we look up and read these? And so I'd like to give you that information now, and I'll uh, try to remember to give it to you again at the, at the end of today's program. So if you Google creation.com, that website will come up, creation.com. And they have a search engine, a little search square up at the top of the page. And if you type into that search square on creation.com, type in in six days, those three words, in six days, the time in which uh, creation took place. So type in in six days. The top item that will come up on that website is actually 
the table of contents of the book and if you click on each name, that will give you the qualifications of the scientists and it will give you their reasons. And you can read them for yourself there freely on the, on the internet. Now, when we discussed uh, some of the issues that why evolution is impossible, one of the important issues we looked at was the concept of the mind and our thoughts we can't weigh our thoughts. They don't have mass. We can't measure their volume. They're, they're non-material. And as I pointed out, one of the world's leading atheist philosophers recognises that the Darwinian account, the Darwinian paradigm for how the different organisms and species on Earth form must be false because it can't really explain the origin of the mind. Why? Because the mechanisms involved in evolution involve chemical changes. They, they are simply pure chemistry, altering the DNA, which results in supposedly in sufficient changes in the physical form of the organism to allow it to adapt uh, and have some new features. Of course, uh, that's never been observed, despite the fact, for example, that they've tried to observe these variations by breeding bacteria through tens of thousands of generations. And, and we talked about uh, the, uh, the experiments that have been done at Michigan State uh, uh, University by Richard uh, Lenski and his co-workers. So when we look at it, there, there's, there's no uh, evidence that... Um, that evolution actually produces these new changes anyway. Uh, but these changes are based on chemical changes. These chemical changes then can't produce thoughts. They're non, non-material. So this is a, a very, very serious challenge to, to evolution. We also looked at briefly uh, one of the, the leading um, thermodynamic research type uh, scientists, engineers in the world, um, Dr. Jeremy Walter, and how he pointed out uh, that the fundamental law of thermodynamics is that ordered states run down and become disordered. In other words, huge amount of energy is required to make things ordered. And we showed that many uh, pro-evolutionists, supporters of evolutionists say, oh, well, the, the, the second law of thermodynamics doesn't really apply in the evolutionary case uh, because uh, to require, you know, the requirement for much more structured DNA uh, is directly against the, the second law of thermodynamics. And... So here we have, uh, again, growing evidence that this order can't arise by chance. We, we briefly referred to James Clark Maxwell, the brilliant physicist that um, discovered that light was a combination of electric and magnetic fields and, and derived the equations that uh, underpin field theory, a uh, very important um, theory. And he, with his model, uh, uh, pointed out that you know the only way that you could get round this this second law was through the, the he supposes supernatural um, uh, sort of well he proposed the idea of a, a demon not like a demon in the Bible but a, a sort of a science demon that could somehow break the the law of second dynamics but then we learned that the famous physicist Leo Zalard. Uh, who uh, we recall uh, first patented the concept of a nuclear chain reaction, brilliant physicist, pointed out that, again, the energy requirements for the, the demon to sort the molecules um, is uh, far greater um, and, in actual fact, requires that energy input. So the second law of thermodynamics is conserved and preserved. So one of the other things we can now uh, look at then is what about the concept of the dating of the rocks? And I think this is probably the greatest concern that many Christians have. What about radiometric dating? Now, I'll address this uh, probably in, in, uh, in future faith and science episodes in, in growing detail. But one of the contributors in the book In Six Days, uh, which again, as I said, if you do a search on creation.com for In Six Days, you'll come across the name Paul Guillaume. 
And he is uh, a professor of uh, emergency medicine at uh, Loma Linda University. So his background is medical training, but also in chemistry. And he grew up as a Christian, and he was challenged by the, uh, the radiometric dating data in terms of the long age, supposed long ages for life on Earth. Whereas the Bible talks about, you know, life on Earth only being thousands of years old, probably in the order of, you know, five, six thousand years old um, or thereabouts, sometime around about six thousand years. And so he spent quite a lot of time actually researching the science behind radiometric dating. And he, he published a book on this. It was called Scientific Theology. And he dealt with a number of uh, science, faith issues or faith and science issues. And in particular, um, the radiometric dating uh, methodology. And he came across some, some interesting things. So we use potassium argon dating as one dating method that is used. And he showed that potassium argon dating gave some major inconsistencies. For example, it often gave... You know, millions of years for rock for lava flows that we had been historically observed that were only hundreds of years old. So there were major inconsistencies there. But one of the things that really shed light on one of the major problems with the potassium argon dating was that, in actual fact, when he looked at how deep the rocks were and the supposed age of the rocks, it simply meant that the lower rocks had more argon than the rocks higher up. So the amount of argon in the rocks was simply uh, a function of how far down the rocks were. So it was sort of really independent of, of age. Matter of fact, depending on the potassium content, you, you simply got the, the age of the rock from those ratios there. But, of course, that really doesn't make good sense science. Some, that suggests that some other process is really going on. Similarly, with the rubidium-strontium data, that seemed to follow mixing correlations rather than the actual age of the rocks. And when they did, uh, he found results where they did uranium dating on coal seams that were hundreds of millions of years old, and yet the uranium lead dating brought some of these down to only a few hundred thousand years old. But what he found was most interesting was the carbon-14 dating. And there was a lot of carbon-14 dating to, to analyse. And essentially what he found was that whenever they carbon dated things like coal or other objects that were millions of years old, they inevitably got carbon dating results less than about 55,000 years. So here we have coal that's supposed to be, say, anywhere from um, 300,000 years to 300 million years old, somewhere in that range. No matter what age the, the coal was according to the conventional dating, the actual results came back to less than about 55,000 years or less. So there's a major uh, discrepancy there. The interesting thing was that the values all tended to be about the same. So in a range of about 30,000 years to 55,000 years. So whereas the uh, dates of millions of years, some of those coal samples might have been 100 million years, some 200 million years, some 150 million years. Why was the carbon-14 results in such a narrow band compared to the actual overall age, supposed age? And this gave another important clue because we will talk about perhaps in more detail in another time, but the carbon-14 dating is dependent on cosmic ray flux, which is in turn dependent on the Earth's magnetic field, which we know has been decreasing. And when we correct for some of these effects, including the uh, carbon dioxide content in the atmosphere and so forth, it brings these ages of 30,000 years, 50,000 years, back to ages around about 4,000 years, which is roughly around the time of the flood. 
And so this was a very, very important finding uh, that he found when he surveyed the uh, literature. So that's a, an interesting article that um, that you can read there, and he has more data in uh, his books. And also, if you uh, do a Google search on his name and radiometric dating, you'll come across uh, papers that he's published in journals summarising uh, this data. And so that's another important point that I want to raise with our talks in, with regard to uh, faith and science. This debate is highly controversial and, you know, both sides are, are, are claiming to be right. So it's very important that we actually look at data and not claims that people are making. When I've uh, looked at the data out there in regard to the evidence for evolution, my conclusion is clearly that it's impossible, and, and that's why I've recorded these, uh, the reasons and the references to the scientific literature in my book, uh, Evolution Impossible, uh, 12 Reasons Why Evolution Cannot Explain the Origin of Life on Earth, because it is important that we actually see the science and the, the weaknesses in the science. Now, the weaknesses in the science are actually uh, recognised by... Uh, by many leading scientists. There, Richard Lewinton uh, was a, a professor of zoology at Harvard for many years and a, a very strong proponent of uh, evolution. And uh, he, he's, he's quite famous. He was in, involved in uh, uh, molecular biology, uh, developed some of the techniques that are used in molecular biology, uh, particularly mathematical techniques. But in an article written in 1997, he, he wrote something that's quite interesting. And, and this is quoted uh, by Jonathan Safati, one of the contributors, again, to the book In Six Days, which I'll discuss in a moment. But uh, Jonathan uh, quotes uh, Richard Lewinton as follows. This is what Richard Lewinton wrote in his article. Listen carefully. We take the side of science in spite of the patent absurdity of some of its constructs, in spite of its failure to fulfil many of its extravagant promises of health and life, in spite of the tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories. And evolution is one of those just-so stories. The theory of evolution is, is not proven to date. We have overwhelming evidence that is absolutely impossible. We have overwhelming evidence that life living cell cannot form by itself from non-living molecules. It's a supernatural event to create life. But here we see one of the leading evolutionary biologists in the world at the time, um, a professor at Harvard, one of the leading universities in the world uh, in, in this particular area. And here he writes that the scientists have a tolerance or there's a tolerance of the scientific community for unsubstantiated just-so stories. Why? And this is what he goes on, and this is what he says, quote, because we have a prior commitment, a commitment to materialism. Now, materialism is essentially the view that the material world is all that there is and that there's no supernatural world. There's, there's no God. There's no other causes outside the material world. And so this really is, he he's said it very plainly, this is the commitment of our science educators, that science must be based just on a material worldview. He, he goes on now, and quoting Richard Lewiston again, it is not that the methods and institutions of science somehow compel us to accept a material explanation of the phenomenal world, but, on the contrary, that we are forced by our, our a priori adherence to material causes 
to create an apparatus of investigation and a set of concepts that produce material explanations, no matter how counterintuitive, no matter how mystifying to the uninitiated. In other words, he says, we have this priority and we are forced by our choice to adhere to a material cause to create an approach in science that produces explanations that we accept no matter how counterintuitive they are. Now, really, the, the concept of non-living, non-living molecules becoming a living system is really counterintuitive. We never observe it. We know that if something is dead, it's dead. I mean, scientists in the laboratory can kill a little E. coli bacteria by just putting a tiny little drop of toluene and destroying the outer membrane and just for a moment disrupting its energy process and the little bacteria dies. All the components are there. All the biopolymers are there. All the DNA is there. All the enzymes are there. But we can't make it alive. They're just dead molecules. They're just molecules. We can't make those molecules alive again, even though they're all there and they're all in the structure. We just can't do it. And the reason? The reason is because to put them, make them alive, we would have to set in motion about 600 biochemical reactions all in just the right state of disequilibrium. That is, they have to be out of balance by just the right amount to cause a reaction to go, to produce just the right amount of material for the next reaction to be out of balance by just the right amount to produce the material for the next reaction to go, to be just out of balance by just the right amount to make the next reaction go. 600 types of reactions, all out of balance by just the right amount uh, simultaneously at the same time. And, of course, we know that there, there are more problems. The biopolymers that um, are found in nature uh, break down in water. Uh, and, of course, most of the models that are painted in the textbook say that the first life evolved in some you know, primeval soup in, in the sea. And um, a, publi- a paper published in, in Nature you know, 15 years ago pointed out that these biopolymers break down in water. And it said this is you know, not good news for the evolutionary model. Well, well it's very good news, news for the creation model. Lewinton goes on with one more sentence in this particular little quote. And this is what he says, following on. So even though... Um, these findings of science might be counterintuitive and mystifying, it doesn't matter. What he goes on, he says this, quote, Moreover, that materialism is an absolute, for we cannot allow a divine foot in the door. So we can see that this whole teaching of evolutionary theory is, and the way science is set up now within our universities and schools, particularly with relate to the origin of life situation, is deliberately to keep the divine foot out of science. It's set up to keep God out of science. Now, Jonathan uh, Safati points out, for example, that in nature there are amazing design things. And one of the examples he looks at, for example, is simply the, do, uh, the dolphin sonar system. And he points out that, you know, the US Navy have studied the dolphin sonar system. So sonar system is where sound is used to locate objects because these dolphins, their, their location system is so precise they can detect a, a small fish uh, you know, 70 metres away with great precision. But this sonar system is, is based on a, a sound lens uh, which the dolphin uses to emit soft waves. But this lens is actually made up of uh, three different types of fats. Uh, they're called lipids. Uh, and they have a, f- a unique fat composition that bends the sound waves in a particular way that enables the dolphin to focus. Now, the fascinating thing is that these fats, 
they're special fats. They're very different to the fats in the blubber of the whale. They are unique fats that are found just in this lens of this sonar lens of the dolphin. Moreover, these fats are produced by specific chemical reactions using specific enzymes that are made by complicated, or these uh, fats are made by a complicated chemical process using specific enzymes that are coded for in the DNA. Now, how can something like that arise by chance? So Dr. Safati, um, uh, he holds a BSc honours in chemistry, uh, first class honours, and a PhD in physical chemistry from Victoria University in in, uh, New Zealand. Uh, and in Wellington, New Zealand, and he's a former New Zealand chess champion, very bright guy. Another uh, scientist was Henry Zuhl. Now, Henry Zuhl has a PhD in biology um, from Loma Linda University, and he was the curator of the Joshua C. Turner uh, Arboretum um, in um, uh, Nebraska. And... um, He points out a very, very interesting fact that when you look at plants, plants require fungi and there's an interrelationship and that biodiversity that we observed in nature with all the plants and animals, they're all interrelated. There's a very important connection between plants animals, fungi, and bacteria. These important connections that we call ecosystems today and biodiversity are essential. Once we start removing an organism from an ecosystem, we usually find that one or two others at least also perish. We are discovering now more and more how much these ecosystems are interconnected. Again, this is very powerful evidence that creation and life of Earth must have been created in a very short time. Well, I can see our time today is is running out. To follow these stories, remember to simply Google creation.com. When you go to that creation.com website, there'll be a search engine up the top. And if you simply enter in the words in six days... You will come to all the chapters in this book, the 50 chapters plus the introduction, and you can look up the words of these scientists, what they actually write, and their references. I look forward to speaking to you next time. This has been Faith and Science, and I'm Dr John Ashton. Bye for now. been listening to a production of 3ABN Australia Radio.